Our present complex cosmos manifests a huge range of temperatures and densities, from blazingly hot stars to the dark night sky, and people sometimes worry about how this intricate complexity can emerge from an amorphous fireball. <coughs> Next, it might seem to violate a hallowed physical principle, the second law of thermodynamics, which describes the inexorable tendency, of course, for patterns and structures to decay or disperse. But the answer to this seeming paradox lies in the force of gravity. Gravity enhances density contrasts rather than wiping them out. So any patch that starts off slightly denser than average will decelerate more because it feels extra gravity and its expansion lags behind. And the next slide, please, um, movie. Uh, this shows how in the expanding universe the density contrasts grow and starting off from an amorphous region we end up with structures. This models a domain large enough to contain several hundred galaxies. And movies of this kind portray how galaxies emerge about 16 powers of 10 faster than real time and each galaxy is then an arena within which stars, planets and perhaps life can emerge. And we can now highlight a few stages that happen along the way. We can confidently go back to when the universe was a nanosecond old. That's the time when every particle had about the energy we can achieve in the uh, LHC accelerator. Next slide. So we have protons and neutrons combining in the first three minutes to make deuterium and helium. Next. And then everything expands, cools and dilutes until the gas becomes neutral and transparent. Next. The universe enters a literally dark age when the cooling shifts the primordial light into infrared. And then, next, the first stars form and light it up again. And then these stars assemble into galaxies, fusion process within them, synthesize the periodic table from pristine hydrogen, and they fling this processed material back into space, as happens here. That's the messy death of a star like the Sun, and here in the Crab Nebula. And this debris then recondenses into new stars, most orbited by planets, in dusty, glowing clouds like this. And here we see the cycling of gas through successive generations of stars. <coughs> Crucial to this whole process is gravity, which allows structures to form, as I showed in a movie. It's a very weak force. On the atomic scale, it's about 40 powers of 10 weaker than the electric force. But in any large object, positive and negative charges almost... So, can we go back one? Go back. Yep, yeah. Positive and negative charges almost exactly cancel out. But in contrast, everything has the same gravitational charge, as it were. So gravity wins out in big systems. And this diagram of log mass against log radius shows a lot of physics. Atomic nuclei and atoms, black holes, the slope one on this diagram. Note that a black hole, the size of a proton, has a mass of 10 to 38 protons. That reflects the weakness of gravity. And if we look at the line of slope three on the right, that's solid objects. Constant density, sugar lumps, asteroids and planets, and then we get stars. And right on the left is where quantum theory and gravity meet, the Planck mass, when the black hole has the same radius as its Compton wavelength. Now, from diagrams like this, you could predict what stars were like, even if you lived on a perpetually cloud-bound planet. Were gravity not so weak, the graph would have the same shape, but there'd be fewer powers of 10 between the micro and the cosmic scale and less space and time for complexity. So let me now step back a bit and ask what are the essential features of our universe which allow it to evolve from an amorphous, dense beginning into its present complexity, to be the arena for this chain of events. Next. First, as I said, we need gravity, but the weaker the better, because if it's weak, then there are many powers of 10 between the macro and the micro scales. Next, there are other requirements. Clearly, the universe can't always stay in thermodynamic equilibrium. It's got to 
expand enough that it becomes transparent. Third, there must be matter-antimatter asymmetry. Otherwise, as the universe expanded and cooled, everything would annihilate into radiation. And another requirement for stars, planets, and biospheres is the possibility of complex chemistry. If hydrogen were the only element, chemistry would be very dull. So we've got to have uh, something like the uh, binding energy diagram like this uh, for um, chemical elements. Right, um, so next, uh, we have to have at least one star. And then next, we need to have a tuned cosmic expansion rate because uh, if the universe expanded too soon, expanded, uh, collapsed too soon, it would all be in thermal equilibrium. If it expanded too fast, then gravity would not be, pulled, be able to pull together structures to make uh, uh, galaxies and stars. Uh, next. And we also need non-zero fluctuations in the early universe, because uh, if the universe was completely smooth to start with, it would even now, after 10 billion years, be just uh, cold neutral hydrogen and nothing else. Next. Um, this uh, picture, which I like to show, sort of Ouroboros, uh, this gives a picture uh, of uh, uh, the very small on the left, the very large on the right. On the left, we have the domain of the quantum. On the right, we have the domain of gravity. And, of course, as we know, uh, uh, there is no unified theory yet that unifies the quantum world and gravity. And that doesn't matter for most of science, because if you're a chemist, you don't need to worry about the gravitational force between two atoms. It's 40 powers of 10 weaker than electric forces. Conversely, if you're studying orbits of planets, you don't need to worry about the quantum uncertainty. But to confront the mystery of what banged and why it banged, to go back right to the beginning, then we do need to go back to a stage when, as it were, quantum fluctuations could shake the entire universe. And that's what's symbolized, as it were, gastronomically at the top of this picture here. But before leaving this picture, I want to emphasize that there's a third frontier, apart from the very large and the very small, the very complicated. And the most complicated things are at the bottom. And we are actually, in terms of mass, the geometric mean between protons and stars. The geometric mean of the mass of an atom and the mass of the sun is 50 kilograms, about uh, the mass of people here. And so to understand ourselves, we need to understand the atoms and the stars that made those atoms. Well, the bedrock nature of space and time are certainly among science's great open frontiers. But of course, calling that quest a theory of everything is hubristic and misleading. That's because particle physics and quantum theory are irrelevant to 99% of scientists. Problems in biology and in environmental and human sciences remain unsolved because it's hard to elucidate their complexities, not because we don't understand subatomic physics well enough. Next. You may recognize this. This is a, a, a Hooke's a picture of a flea from his uh, wonderful book, Using the First Microscope. I show this because it emphasizes even an insect, with its layer upon layer of complexity, is harder to understand than a star, where intense heat <laughs> breaks down any complex structure. So the frontier of complexity is more challenging than the very large or the very small, and it's on complexity that 99% of scientists work. Um, finally, uh, next slide. Uh, commenting on the hierarchy of the sciences. The sciences are sometimes likened to different levels of a tall building. With maths at the bottom, then physics, then chemistry, and so on, all the way up to psychology, and then economists in the penthouse, perhaps. And there's a corresponding hierarchy of complexity. Atoms, molecules, cells, organisms, and so forth. But the analogy with the building is poor, because the higher level sciences dealing with complex systems aren't impaired by an insecure base, as a building is. Each level has its own autonomous concepts and theories. As I mentioned earlier, if you're studying the fluid mechanics of waves and turbulence, you don't care that water is H2O. 
to take two other examples, an albatross returns to its nest after wandering 10,000 miles in the southern ocean. And this is a, a prediction, but not the same kind of prediction as astronomers make of celestial orbits and eclipses. So everything, however complicated, breaking waves, migrating birds, and tropical forests is made of atoms and obeys the laws of quantum physics. But even if Schrodinger's equations could be solved for that system, or those systems, their solutions wouldn't offer the enlightenment that scientists seek. So reductionism is true in a sense, but it's seldom true in a useful sense. Each science has its own autonomous concepts and laws. The brain is an assemblage of cells, a painting is an as assemblage of chemical pigments, but in both cases what's important and interesting is the pattern and structure, the emerging complexity, <coughs> not the basic simplicity. Thank you very much.